Um, we will go way back to begin with. Any specific uh, related memories, music-related memories from your childhood, uh, developing a love for music and, in, and also an interest in songwriting? <clears throat> Well, I, I bought all of the Beatles records at the bottom of the street my school was on when I was in, I think, grade six. Uh, they were all in this used record shop, and they were all about a dollar. So I was, uh, it was kind of a toss-up with buying candy, but I started buying them and, <laughs> and taking them home. And uh, I had a, my first sort of platonic girlfriend. We we. We we were in class together, and then we'd go home to our respective houses and get on the phone and, and listen to or talk about the Beatles. And I guess I was the only one listening to the records because she didn't have them. But um, mm. but yeah, that was some of my earliest memories. And then uh, there was a record store that opened up uh, near my house when I was about about that age. I was really into Mad Magazine, so I used to go over to the main street and buy Mad pocketbooks. And then this store called Black Swan Records opened up upstairs above uh, another business and I started going in there and there was this mysterious woman that ran it and she actually started telling me you know things I should buy and so on so that was another really early memory of um, you know buying records and listening and then on the same block basically was a guitar store where I started taking guitar lessons around age 11 so uh, I was pretty immersed at that point looking back do you think there was um, um do you think there was a like a uniform quality amongst the artists that were initially inspiring you? Well, I've always been a pretty uh I don't know what you'd call it like obsessive listener even to this day. Um so when I was young I was obsessed with especially John Lennon, but mostly the Beatles, uh, not so much the solo stuff. Um and then after that I was just obsessed with uh Bob Dylan for many many years. So I've I've always been on this pattern where I just get so into somebody and, and I buy all the records and I'm pretty much to the um, um, extent that I don't listen to much else. So actually a lot of stuff that my peers kind of came up all being familiar with, some of it I was completely ignorant um, of, like things like Led Zeppelin and The Clash and so on because I just was so focused on these individual artists. Um, and so, I mean, and, you know, more than a common thread, it was actually a pretty narrow, uh, pretty narrow exposure in in a way but in another way i was really actively buying records and and listening to them on my own so i was you know really delving into it in a way that i don't think a lot of people back then were able to maybe nowadays it's it's you just do that more naturally because it's at your fingertips mm. now you mentioned guitar lessons at 11 how far did did you go with those so i think i read somewhere you were pretty much self-taught yeah i did it for about two years um and there was a really good teacher, and he kind of drifted away, and then I never found somebody else that um, picked up where he, you know, at the level that he had worked. Like, he just did amazing work looking back, you know, for how little he was probably getting paid. I mean, he was transcribing all kinds of folk songs, all the tablature and things that I wanted. So I tried someone else after that, and um, I just couldn't match it. So uh, at that point, I just sort of started playing on my own, and... Um, and yeah, that's sort of that's where it's always been since then. Now I'm not a guitar player, but like you, I am a left-hander. So, did you have any obstacles to overcome there, developing the, the style with on your left hand? Sorry, could you say that again about? Uh, I'm saying I'm not a guitar player myself, but like you, I am left-handed, and I was just wondering if yeah. uh, in in your learning years there was obstacles to overcome then being being left-handed. Oh uh, well. I mean, I think that it forced me to focus at least on the guitar and maybe, you know, focus just on one guitar. Mm. Um, I've never was able to really collect any because um, there just weren't any. And um, also, you know, especially when later on when I got into bluegrass and so on, I, I would have probably picked up mandolin or fiddle or something, and I just didn't. So uh, and in some ways I saw that as a positive because I just, you know, I just stuck with the guitar. I guess maybe at an earlier age... It was like smoking menthol cigarettes, and you, nobody wants your cigarettes. Like I just always get to keep my guitar because <laughs> nobody else is going to play it, you know. Uh, and I mean, I also, I mean, I did learn to play upside down. I, I still can a fair bit, although I, I would never do it on stage or recording or anything. So I don't think that was a big part of it, but I mm. think it helps to to you know feel that you're outside of the norm and um, 
and and have to sort of look at your instrument a little bit differently. Yeah. I believe you played in a reggae band in your younger days. Yeah, I actually um, I got really into reggae. Uh, I, I'm sure it's not unique to Toronto, but Toronto has a very big Jamaican population and big Caribbean population. And actually, um, reggae was quite popular at that point. I mean, it was, I guess, early 90s, uh, late 80s. It's, I mean, what that kind of reggae that had more, in my opinion, of like a direct lineage to the sort of 70s stuff was still quite popular. And there were a number of clubs in Toronto. And there was also quite a big... Uh, like more spiritual reggae scene, you know, like there were Nyabingi societies and music clubs that weren't even really like, you know, bars or dance clubs. So there was a big scene and I was really into uh, collecting it and listening to it. And so while I was in high school, I think I was 15 or 16, I uh, somehow was able to join this reggae band playing rhythm guitar. And uh, we did that for a few years and you know, it's so far removed from what I do now, but uh, it was definitely my early start in terms of playing concerts and working with other musicians. And also, I guess, seeing a songwriter, the guy, the guy was a man named Quinseb, who uh, now lives in Ethiopia, like a real Rasta, like he emancipated and everything, you know. Mm. And the songs were really quite amazing. They were very spiritual and they were very interesting and complex. And uh, so he was a... Yeah, I think he was a very big influence, um, probably when I was still a bit too young to appreciate the, the value of that, um, or even maybe to appreciate what I was absorbing. But, uh, but yeah, that was my first uh, sort of performing musical experience. Now, you've often been compared to artists of that uh, singer-songwriter movement of the early 70s, reading a lot of reviews of your albums. Um, how much of a role did that era of music uh, have in developing your style? Well, when I was younger, I mean, that's a strange thing. I don't know if it happened ever as much as it happened in our generation where a lot of us were so tuned into music, you know, from 20 years, you know, earlier, um, at, you know, at the expense of listening to our own music. So, I mean, I was steeped in a lot of that stuff, like whether it was The Grateful Dead or, or Jimi Hendrix or, um, you know, obviously I mentioned, like, I listened to a, a ton of Bob Dylan, but in terms of what people were listening to at parties and what people were playing on their own guitars, it was it was all music at that time. Uh, Neil Young was a big one. Not so much Gordon Lightfoot. Um, James Taylor was a, was a really big one. So, I mean, it was kind of the... <clears throat> it was the music of someone else's time. You know, it wasn't mm. ours in so many ways, but... It literally was the music of that time for for me and a lot of my friends. Like that's just what we listened to. I don't know. I don't think there was some conscious choice, but I guess in some ways we weren't seeing anything, or we weren't seeing much in contemporary popular music that we really wanted to identify with or wanted to listen to all the time. You know, the same way we wanted to delve into that stuff. So, yeah, they're they're interesting. I mean, it's a bigger, much bigger topic. Like there's that whole story with that Eagles documentary about how their fame kind of coincided with the origin of nostalgic radio, you know? Yeah. And so they actually really exploded, like, kind of after they broke up, because they were sort of the first wave of nostalgia, you know, mm. right out of having been a contemporary band. And, mm. I mean, I guess there was something like that going on, too, where those people who who just it sort of ossified, you know, like whether it's Neil Young or Mick Jagger, they've just gone on to be more and more legendary. But I guess that was sort of taking hold at that point, and you know, among other things, I guess we were caught up in that, but that's all hindsight. I mean, I just love those songs. So, uh, I wouldn't say that I was ever setting out to emulate it, but I certainly grew up with that music. Just the same. Have you ever, during your recordings, made a conscious effort not to show too much of your influences in your work to, to be known for your own sound? Is that something you're aware of and conscious of when, when recording? Well, I, I've never felt, I mean, I've never had a producer on an album. And, and I guess by default, myself and the engineer would be the producer. But I think even that would be a bit of an overstatement. And it's quite, um, it's quite a, I mean, obviously there are choices. But for the most part, it's choices in terms of who you're working with and then all the songwriting that I do. And I'm never really working with people up until the point when I meet them in the studio. So... Aside from choosing who's going to play bass or um, who's, you know, and so on, uh, it's it's all pretty instantaneous. So I, I wouldn't say that I had a lot of control either to make it that way or to, you know, 
go out of my way to not make it that way. Um, I mean, I guess maybe I gravitate to people that share the same aesthetic or something, but mm. yeah, the way I've worked, um, partly for an aesthetic choice and partly just for like budgetary purposes has been to work very quickly. Like pretty much everything on the album is, is it's, they're very little overdubbing unless it was more of a scheduling thing. Like everything's live and everything's done right there. And I mean, certainly Dylan, and this is not really what you're asking about, I guess, but Dylan was always an influence with that because there's always these stories about how, you know, he recorded like Rolling Stone and one or two takes and yeah. certain albums where they just one take. And it's not so much about saying, Oh, well, if I do that, it'll sound like that, but it's more like appreciating that, I don't know, ethos or whatever, that you don't have to be precious about it. And, uh, and I just learned early on that you could really get mired in thinking about it too much and um, and especially doing stuff in post-production that can just become kind of burdensome, burdensome. So I tend to do more of that mulling at the songwriting process, which is most of what I do, than mm -hmm. the recording periods, which are pretty short. Then again, I mean, not to go too far on about your question, but I guess you do spend a certain amount of time mixing and um, you know, and I guess you do make some choices around reverb and how big a bass is going to sound or something. And I guess, you know, your your ears are always, you know, trained on, on what you listen to. Um, but I think at that point, it, it more comes down to sort of just a greater taste, like what you just do and don't do in a broader sense than saying, oh, let's make it sound more like this band or less like that band. Um, I think I've, I, I, I like to think I've managed to kind of distill that stuff um, and then I also have a certain sensibility that if you were just to try and reference something or really try and lift it, that would always end up being a little bit thin or, you know, obviously derivative. So, uh, so yeah, it's a pretty spontaneous process, but I don't know. I mean, it's kind of lofty stuff. And when we, I remember one time I, w I was really interested in Michael and Dachi when I was young. Um, he, he wrote The English Patient, which became quite a famous movie, and he's quite a famous Canadian writer. And I went to see him speak one time, and he was a very solemn guy, and he just came out, and the first thing he said was, like, I consider myself a reader um, before I consider myself a writer, you know? And in some mm -hmm. ways, I guess, pr that's probably the case for most people that make things. <laughs> like, where else are you going to get it from unless yeah. you, you know, went to opera school and were just trained to sing? But even then, you've got to know the material that you're drawing on. So... I mean, I guess it's, I'm kind of rambling on here, but I, I guess it's, uh, it's all sort of in there, Yeah. but I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not very deliberate in terms of uh, how it comes into play in terms of what I'm making. I try and keep it pretty instantaneous. Tell us about your days working alongside Chuck uh, Ehrlichman. Uh, there was a couple of projects on the go with Chuck, wasn't there? Yeah, well, we started out playing when we were in our, you know, early 20s or late teens, and we both were into bluegrass, so we started through that and then we also shared a lot of um common you know artists that we liked and musical tastes and so we really explored that and then one project was right in that vein and that was uh we sort of we knew a lot of stanley butters tunes so we started making these projects um uh where, where we kind of i mean one thing you find with, with bluegrass and a lot of those genres is for some people the adherence to tradition can get a little bit uh, stultifying or suffocating or something and so without being incredibly progressive I think we, we we looked for ways to take our love of that music and just kind of push it out a bit so for instance we did a bunch of Stanley Butter songs um, on like electric piano and electric guitar you know just because um, it seemed like a way to, to take that and move it somewhere else um, in a way that a lot of other people didn't seem to be doing um, but then we just we've always had a good partnership I mean it it comes down to we've always sung really well together and we've, we've known a lot of songs together for a long period of time. So there's almost that kind of um, relationship, sort of like what brothers can achieve, not to the same extent, but, you know, the Everly Brothers or the Lubin Brothers or people like that. I mean, we, we certainly appreciated that kind of closeness and working relationship. And then other ones were just a little bit more free. And I think it was partly just to do with frustration and not being able to really get a career going or, or find people that wanted to work as seriously as we may have wanted to. So we did one called Russian Literature that was pretty out there and mostly just having a good collaborator. Um, although ultimately, you know, um, we sort of haven't produced a whole lot of stuff together or sort of made a career together, but he's still kind of a, a musical brother for me. Mm.
Someone else you also collaborated with in a, in a, in a different way was visual artist Sherry Boyle. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so we did, um, I mean, she was, I wasn't really much of a motivated or organized musician, and she was one of the ones who said, you know, you really got to get out there and, um, and and try and play more and meet other musicians, because she was really a, a very professional artist at that point, and I think she saw me as someone who had potential but wasn't really working it in the right ways. So actually, she um, got this opportunity to do a tour opening for Bonnie Prince Billy on her own, um, and very graciously and very generously <clears throat> turned that into saying, well, I want to do it with this guy. <laughs> you know, So uh, she basically, I mean, made a tremendous opportunity for me that I never would have otherwise encountered um, and said, okay, you, you've got to do this with me. And her art form in, in that field was uh, overhead projections mostly, uh, cutting out and drawing and designing all these animations and all these figures, mostly on acetates, like you would see in an overhead projector in a high school classroom from 20 years ago. Uh, so very uh, crude and basic technique, but very beautiful. And, and I think, you know, but part of the impact was that it was such a simple technology, but it had this amazing result. And she was doing a lot of it. She had done it with Feist. She'd done it with Peaches. She'd done th these shows with a bunch of different artists. And then she'd also done some amazing shows with recorded music. Um, and so she said, you, why don't you write a, a group of songs and then I'll choose from them and we'll make a, um, you know, we'll make a show out of it. And, and so that's what we had. And, and it was based on this tour. We did a, a West Coast tour opening for Bonnie Prince Billy, and that was in 2006. And I mean, with very few exceptions, it was the first time I ever played at a venue. It was the first time I ever went on tour. I mean, aside from, you know, other stuff in my hometown. So it was a really big deal for me, and, and mm. a ton of stuff came out of that. So it really, um, without that, I mean, it's all hindsight, but without that, I, I really don't think I would, you know, probably be even working in music because so many opportunities came out of that one experience. Talk a bit about your, your songwriting. Can you pinpoint a, a time when you really developed a, a self-confidence in, in your writing? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I'm self-confident um, while I'm working or in terms of what I'm working. I mean, feedback definitely helps. And mm -hmm. there are times when you know, you, you get, um, I guess it's, it's often more from peers and, 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 and people than it is from like press or something, but it's always kind of, you know, it's edifying. It feels nice, but, <clears throat> um, no, it's it, for me, actually just going back to what we were just talking about, it was one of those times when I really was just kind of like a rambling musician. And then she said, you got to write these six songs by the end of this month, you know, and I sort of realized my potential in terms of when I actually sat down and worked on it, because it's very hard to find structure, uh, especially when you're younger and, and you don't have a lot of opportunities coming at you. It's hard to find structure in, in a field like this, you know, because who, mm -hmm. who cares when you finish it? And if that's the case, people like me will never finish it. Um, mm -hmm. So that was one time where I thought, wow, you, you know, if I really work at this, then um, I actually really can do something that I like and, and that I'm completely happy with as opposed to, you know, half-baked ideas that are sort of mildly satisfying. And and I think to that end, I've worked to deadlines ever since more so than I've had some growing confidence that what I'm doing is good or, you know, that I'm here to stay or something like that, you know. Yeah. it's um, It really comes out of the love of it. I mean, and, and it's just a love of working the way I do, which is just sitting at home and being interested in an idea and capturing it and developing it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't know who is a very self-confident writer. I'm sure there must be many out there, but I wouldn't describe myself that way. Yeah. Do you have a preferred place to, to sit, a ton of time and place to sit down and, and write or, or a certain frame of mind? Well, you, it's you changed. I, it used to be at nighttime and there's usually, you know, alcohol involved. Um, <laughs> and now it's more like first thing in the morning and, and just in my kitchen or at home. Um, I, there's a place in the country not far from Toronto where I live that uh, belonged to a friend of mine or belongs to a friend of mine um, but was available like more than half of the time. It was just empty. And so uh, I actually did a ton of my writing up there. And it's very much in nature like it's 10 acres of forest there's a great big waterfall and a river and honestly if i if i look at the last five albums i'm sure 
at least 60% of all the songs were written in that place. So um, that, that was a huge um, inspiration and you know opportunity for me, which unfortunately I no longer have, interestingly enough. Um, but I, I think it was as much about being away from a lot of things and, and being able to focus, but I think mm. it was also that environment. Uh, Constant Companion, that album was one that really made people sit up and, and take notice. It got a lot of acclaim and, and attention. Um, did you feel any pressure on you after that point, uh, working towards your next record, a pressure of having something to live up to? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, sh- I'm sure I did. I mean, everything I do, I don't know if this is a weird way to put it, but it's all pretty small time. I mean, we're not talking about big sales or big tours or anything mm. like that, but but nevertheless, I mean, you are aware of the recognition and, and, you know, without knowing necessarily what it was that I'd done, I mean, I realized that, yeah, people, that certainly worked more than anything else to that point. So, um, but then your instinct, or my instinct is, that it's not, you're not, you're not just going to try and recreate that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't really remember, even though it's only six or so years ago, I don't really remember exactly what that pressure felt like or how I dealt with it. But I do, I do feel that, um, the fact that the album after, uh, which is strong feelings it, in hindsight, the process at least feels kind of overworked to me. And, uh, that probably speaks to, to, you know, to what you're talking about. Mm. Um, but I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's always been enough not going on in my career or there's always been enough in my life. And I, I don't mean to sound like I'm complaining, but there's always been enough humility, whether it's about my confidence as a songwriter or about how important my moves or, you know, whatever it is that I do is. Uh, so it, it, it's always, at least to this point, more or less just come down to the main thing, which I do, which is just being at home and, and, and songwriting and, and, you know, when there's enough of that together, then I make an album. You know what I mean? It's not, yeah. uh, there's, there's not many occasions. There have been a few where I'm writing for something or trying to get something done, but for the most part I've remained, I've managed to remain kind of obscure or, you know, cloistered in that, mm-hmm. in that respect. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but, but yeah, when I do have to make a career move, like I'm sure whatever thoughts I had with that album. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course I was aware of that and, and, and and you recognize uh, how some people just, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to go too far around it, but it's like you're kind of always doing the same thing. So when it's not like I worked harder on one album than another album and, and you know, I got away with it or I didn't, you know, or something like that. It's like you're always kind of doing your best, for lack of a better word. So in mm. a way, when something gets more attention, it's a bit of a head scratcher. And I guess someone in a more, you know, functional line of business would really figure out what that was and... and go to that but you know it for me it's sort of a bit more of a mystery because i just kind of work with the best stuff that i've got at the time and the stuff that i'm interested in enough to want to develop and and want to stick with until i can get it done so um the machine is not uh very efficient <laughs> you know <laughs> Spoken to uh, quite a few Canadian artists through the years, and they've often often had it mentioned to me that there's a, a bit of a tendency amongst the Canadian public to not fully embrace their own artists until they've had some sort of validation from America. Have you experienced that at all? I guess so. I mean, I would. I think I've, I'm way more recognized um, outside uh, of my own country than I am here, and mm. I play a lot more very hard i mean it's it's australia is probably similar in in some ways like it's actually just geographically difficult to tour in canada it's it's a very large country with a small population so navigating that industry is a very nuanced thing and and um sometimes it feels really sewed up tight and uh you know and so in some ways there's more opportunities in places like europe and the states but then in another way there's more um competition too so i don't know what it adds up to and and maybe you just you you feel the absence of those things more when it comes to your own country. So mm. there are various factors, but yeah, I, I, I definitely do. And I, and as much as anything, um, you, I just noticed that when it comes up, people in Canadian people in Canada are really picking up on where I've been recognized elsewhere. You know, yeah, yeah. that's the important thing. Like if, if they see that you're in a publication, you know, from England or from the States, you know, I mean, in some, in some cases that's, 
that's enough. But yeah. um, I don't think it's the only thing, but uh, it's certainly a recurring theme through the Canadian arts going back at least a century, if not more. You know, maybe it's a self-consciousness. Maybe it's a certain um, humility that rejects <laughs> or doesn't want to pat people on the back too much. And, and it probably has, serves good purposes too. But, but yes, the short answer is yes, definitely. Yeah, no, it certainly happens here too. So, yeah, I understand that. Um, has becoming a dad in recent years affected the way you approach your music? Well, it's mostly just in terms of how I'm able to work, you know, just like the, the finding the time, basically. Mm. Um, so, and and it's evolving, you know. I mean, my, my life has evolved on a steeper curve in the last few years than probably over the last 20 years. So you're, you're trying to catch up. Um, but, the, you know, the things that I do are not changing. I'm still playing guitar all the time and I'm still working on songs. Um, like today... I was listening to this, someone sent me this podcast, it's an interview with these different Nashville writers, and it just really inspired me to want to go and write for a bit, but I had my son with me all day, and I was like, I, whatever, I just got to do it, so I went and sat down, and so he came down and sat with me, and I, I was working on this song, <laughs> and, he, and he knows that he doesn't have my attention, you know, so he's like shouting over me, and then I'm like, okay, we're going to record this, and he's shouting over <laughs> the recording, and it was, I mean, it sounds the terrible by some standards, but it was actually very funny, you know, and mm. I don't do a lot of collaborating. So I actually sort of thought, man, this is like, this is very unconventional, but it's not that far off the mark because he's kind of responding to my idea and, <laughs> and so on. So it's a, it's a, you know, um, it's really changed where I work and it's probably why I work more in the morning. And if I can get up early and no one's awake, then that's a great time. But, uh, thematically in terms of what I'm interested in and interested in and what I write about, I, I haven't noticed like where it's made some specific change. Now, you've been with no quarter records since the, the beginning. So it's obviously a, a happy association. What, what is it about that label that makes them a perfect fit for you? Well, it's just the guy that runs it. I mean, we have a very personal relationship, and I trust him, and I know that he's very hardworking. And uh, it's not kind of like where you're going to knock on some big golden door hoping that they're going to lift you up. It's more that him and I, like, I feel like I can really identify with his um, his own struggle and, and his own path because, we. I mean, we literally are on it together. I'm one of the artists on this small label, Um and uh, and also, it's hard in music. Like, I've had it happen a few times with agents and so on. It's really hard when, when people come and go. It can be complicated. It can be acrimonious. And it makes you really value um, uh, people that you can work with. And sometimes, even when it's difficult, you say, well, the longevity alone is probably something to factor in, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just... Uh, he literally contacted me out of the very first tour I did. And then, you know, he's that tour is the reason he contacted me and he's the reason why I was ever, ever able to make an album, you know? So he's just, uh, at least, you know, all this way up to now, he's, he's really just central to it. You've had some wonderful players on, on your albums. What, what do you look for in a musician that makes them the kind of musician that, uh, that you would like to work with? Well, I mean, I guess it's people that, it sounds like such a flaky thing to say, but people that you just know are kind of inherently nice, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, there's some people that are really competent, interesting, but they can be really pushy or demanding, and to me, it would never be worth it, you know, for whatever skill they might have. Um, just a comfortable environment. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, I, I, you just, I, I notice things about people's playing, whether it's, I don't know a lot about drumming or a lot about bass playing, I don't think, but I just notice when I like certain players, keyboard players too. Um, and, um, and also I'm not a, I don't think I'm a great communicator when it comes to being a producer or directing. So uh, whatever they bring to it is, is really going to be the sound and it's going to be the arrangement. So uh, I guess it's that you have to have that sort of strong first instinct um, or, you know, and I mean, working with someone like Garth Hudson, for instance, that's not to say that I like, you know, rub my chin and considered him in the Rolodex. I mean, that was more just like a neat opportunity, you know, and 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 uh, worked out on all the levels that I just described. But 
Yeah, it, it, it's, it has to be a comfortable um, environment. And I guess it has to be people that are able to work without a lot of direction because that's kind of my way and to work quickly, not, not you know, to crack the whip, but just because I think it's a good way to, to work, not, not to overthink it too much. And everyone I work with is comfortable with that and, and does a great job under those circumstances. So, I mean, there's so many individual people and they've all got such unique, traits in every area so that's a bit of a broad way to answer it but mm-hmm. i've been really lucky with that and well to have someone those, those with... recordings sorry go ahead no you're right no i was going to say oh, you're going to say i mean the... yeah, no go ahead go ahead <laughs> i was <laughs> i was just going to say to have someone of the caliber of garth hudson willing to to contribute to your record it must have given you a great boost of, of confidence as as an artist it did i mean it was it was so kind of like it was, it was absolutely a delight, but in the moment it was so stressful and scary, you know, <laughs> there, there, there wasn't really a lot of time to think about that, you know? Um, so I like, I, I did enjoy it, you know, I, I didn't just suffer through it, but man, I just was on my toes and I was kind of, uh, you know, freaking out and, and just trying to get my thing done in a way that would, would honor, you know, the caliber of player that he is. So yeah. I've said this to a few people, like I really didn't actually even know what he did until we went and listened to it, you know, I think almost a month later, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had so much fun, like going to his hotel and picking him up and like sitting around and eating lunch together. That was amazing. Yeah. But in, in terms of the, the music, it was, it was like, all right, you, you got to be on and you, you can't screw up and, and you know, you got to make sure you're getting good takes and stuff. So, I, I guess it's one of those things where it's like one of the really special moments in your life, but you're called upon. <laughs> you're not really there in some ways to to bask in it because you got to keep working. He gives the impression of being somewhat of like an eccentric uh, musical genius. How did you find him in the studio? Uh, well, he's his. I mean, he he's eccentric, I guess. I mean, yeah, yeah. You're not wrong. I mean, I, but he's. He like as a technician and as someone with musical knowledge, I mean, he's so bang on, you know. And he's just he's just seeing volumes in in anything that you're suggesting, any chord change, any reference or anything. So uh, he's not out on another planet, you know. Not there's anything wrong with that, but he's he's in, he's incredibly confident, and it's uh, I mean, confident isn't even the word, you know. It's just that's absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, and the other thing that for for me like. I think a lot of people forget this is a lot of these people like we are so latched onto a period in their lives that was like half a century ago, you know, and someone that's so music, such an active musical mind has been working all through those ensuing decades and learning and growing, you know, so you sort of have to try and get past your expectations or your associations with them. Um, but yeah, he kind of also, I don't know. I mean, maybe someone with a different kind of attitude might give more direction, but with someone like him, like I'm, I'm just not really confident telling him to do this as opposed to that. Yeah. I just know, I, I just trust that anything that he's going to come up with is going to be way more interesting than, you know, if I was to sort of <laughs> try and make him a vehicle for some creative idea that I had, you know? Mm. So you're really just trying to stay out of someone like that's way and just make sure they're comfortable and, and hope that the material is inspiring enough that they'll, you know, it'll it'll bring them out. Talk about your current album, uh, Start a Home. If there was a, an occurring, reoccurring theme that uh, appears throughout the songs in the album, what would it be? Well, it never would have occurred to me until I started getting feedback on it. But um, yeah, there there does seem to be this thing about you know homes and, and places that comes up at least a few times and. Um, uh, I guess consider, I mean, it's not, it's hardly new stuff for me, you know, and like considering, um, relationships that have go- gone on. I mean, yeah, it's funny. I, uh, to be honest, I feel a little bit out of practice with giving a summation of it. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I really, um, just work by the songs and I'm sure there's some kind of design in there in terms of which ones you're, you're drawing together or working on, but yeah, it's it's always fascinating to me when people start to respond to the album or anything that they they start to draw stuff out of it that just never would have occurred to me. And I don't think it's baloney at all. I think in some ways, I guess I just can't see it or, or don't realize it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I hate to 
I hate to sort of let some idea about it down, but I'm just so grateful when I've got the songs done. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and I I'm, I'm not quite the empresario um, that that sort of it's definitely not a concept album in that way. You know? No, no. Uh, it was a a bit of a drawn out production process, wasn't it? Recorded <clears throat> over a, a few different locations again before you got to the finished product. Did, did that become a little bit frustrating at times? Uh, yeah, I mean, and I did take stuff out of almost all of those things, so they weren't entirely in vain, but, uh, they were, um, it was frustrating because you, it takes a while to get up to that point and it takes money and then you're done. And then if you know, you're sort of to some extent back at the bottom again, you have to get back up to that. That was a little bit hard. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess in some ways there's there's like such listlessness and apathy there, right? Um, because it just went on for so long and someone else might get it done. But then I guess in another way, there's some sort of really subtle determination there where you're willing to go through all those processes where someone else might say good enough or just drop it and do something else mm-hmm. and, and still just hold on to some idea, even if you don't entirely know what it is, you know? So, um, I think there were a lot of external factors just about my lifestyle and so on, but um, that it was just hard to sort of carve out that time and, and have self-indulgent focused work. But yeah, ultimately you, you know, you've got to, uh, in in the end I felt good. You know, I, I actually really enjoyed listening to it. I was talking about this with someone the other day and it's such an interesting thing because there's another Canadian songwriter and they said almost exactly the same thing as me, which is that, after an album is done, so it, there's nothing more you can do to it. The artwork's done, it's mastered, it won't be changed. I listened to it like 100, 150 times. And I wouldn't say it's just like narcissism, but it, there's there's something to it. But then basically the day it comes out, I never listen to it again. I mean, mm-hmm. I might come across it. You know, so it, it's a really strange thing. And I think a lot of people, just from what I've heard here and there, go through this. So I don't know what it is, but... Anyway, when I was done, I I, uh, I was really happy with it, and I think that that's probably I, I just knew that all the trials, although there were great efforts and great players, they just hadn't got there yet. So it, it's just a certain kind of quality standard, um, more than it's like searching for a certain kind of expression or a certain um, product. I don't know. I mean, it's well, it doesn't sound like an album that was recorded in bits and pieces in different places. It doesn't sound disjointed at all. So you, was that a fear of yours, though? It wasn't, yeah, because it's funny. You, I mean, you'd think that would be a very reasonable concern, but both the engineer, and I've worked with Stu Crooks, the same engineer, for all my recordings. We both kind of knew that it wouldn't matter in the end, and that's somewhat to do with mixing or mm-hmm. mastering, but it's also, it, it, it it's not as place can can have a really valuable role but it's not as important as uh some people think it might be so yeah it never really was a worry and actually there's some very disparate sessions the song drinking with a friend is like in a basement you know with a bottle of wine and and then there are songs that are very set up with all the proper microphones and all the everyone ready to go at zero and everything but yeah it it, it never really worries me uh, because i don't even I, I mean, I don't even know where it would be a problem for me on someone else's album. I think it's kind of cool. Um, I don't know, like, is that Dylan album, uh, Down in the Groove? It's like a weird cover album, but oh, yeah, it's just like yeah. there's songs from all over the place, like the songs yeah. that he wrote with the Grateful Dead, and there's like like a bluegrass version of Shenandoah, and I kind of love that. So, mm. yeah, I, yeah, even if it was disjointed, I, I don't think that would necessarily be a bad thing. Talk about uh, performing live. What, what's the extent of your, your touring these days? Well, I was in Ireland uh, in the fall, and I was in the States for two weeks in December, and I'm, I've got a handful of shows in Canada th- this month and in March, so it's pretty light. Uh, the, the, this tour in the States was sort of one of the longer ones I've done in a while, and I just am on my own in a rental car with one acoustic guitar, so it's not a very um, glamorous or complicated <laughs> production. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a funny thing because it, uh, you know, it's how I make all the songs, but it's not often how I record them. So, uh, it's always kind of strange how the recording ends up being this kind of diversion somehow from 
most of what I do, whether it be performing or writing. And yet I just find recording and, and other people's recording so interesting that I wouldn't really, you know, I, I was just so tempted to try all those different things, work with different musicians and so on. But yeah, the touring, uh, I'm not doing a ton. And that's partly just the stage that my family's at. I, I, I don't think under these circumstances I could be away for months and months at a time. I don't think I would like that. Or mm. That would be good. But um, I'd, I'd like to be touring more, to be honest. I mean, I, I, I really do enjoy it. And um, so I imagine I'll probably have a few different runs coming up in 2019. Wonderful. Well, we hope one day you can uh, pencil in Australia for a visit too. We'd love to see you down here. I would love to get down there. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a glaring omission on my uh, on my list of, of continents and countries. So I would I would absolutely love to. Terrific. Well, we'll be here ready and waiting. Hey, Doug, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure catching up with you. Yeah, it's really nice talking to you. I hope it's not so uh, drawn out that you can't parse it into something meaningful, <laughs> but. Uh, tend to ramble a bit, but I really enjoyed talking to you. No, that'll be awesome. We'll put together a nice special uh, all based around the music of Doug Paisley. Okay, great. Thanks again. Well, thank Take you care. very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you too. Uh, Take care. Thank Bye. you. All Bye-bye.